and welcome to Justice members and all non-members who are joining us tonight from across Scotland and beyond. We've got, we think, over 450 people attending this evening, uh, which is a new record for this lecture. Um, as some of you aren't members of Justice, um, here's a bit of background. Um, Justice is an all-party law reform and human rights charity working to strengthen the justice system and make it more accessible and fairer across the United Kingdom. We're a membership organisation and events like these are only made possible because of the support of our membership. Um, I will say a little more about how to join and get more involved at the end and um, once you've been inspired to do so by our speakers. Um, justice Scotland has recently been involved in much of the constitutional work um, on the independent review of administrative law um, and the review of the Human Rights Act, um, some of which we will discuss this evening. And we also have a dedicated Justice Scotland intern in Scotland to bring a Scottish perspective to our work. And before we start the event, um, there is a small amount of housekeeping to cover. Um, there will be um, a Q&A session at the end um, of the four contributions. Um, please uh, submit your questions in the Q&A box, which you should find at the bottom of your screen. Um, not the chat box, please. We won't be monitoring it. Um, and if you have a question that's specific to a particular uh, contributor, then, then please say that person's name if the question's directed towards them. Um, now, as there are, we hope, over 400 of us attending, um, please, can you hold off asking questions in the Q&A box um, until Lord Hodge announces that um, the Q&A session is open? Um, we fear we won't be able to monitor that many questions um, if we don't control it in some way um, and we don't want to miss them. Um, the webinar will be recorded um, and we will upload it to the members only area in uh, on our website in due course, which justice members can view at any time. The recording won't include the Q&A. So now it simply remains for me to introduce you to your chair for the event, uh, which is no less than the Deputy President of the Supreme Court. We're very pleased to have Lord Hodge chair our event. He's been a long-standing supporter of our work in Scotland, and it's great to be able to welcome him back. Lord Hodge has a CV much too long and distinguished to do justice to in the short time that I have. So I'm afraid I'm compelled to pick out the highlights. Um, he was admitted to the Faculty of Advocates in 1983 and appointed Queen's Counsel in 1996. From 1997 to 2003, he served as a part-time law commissioner at the Scottish Law Commission. And from 2000 to 2005, he was a judge of the Courts of Appeal of Jersey and Guernsey and a procurator to the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland. He was appointed a Senator of the College of Justice in 2005. Um, that's a judge to the non-lawyers attending. Um, and he served as a judge in Scotland until being appointed as a judge in the Supreme Court in London in 2013. He has served there since 2013, um, being appointed Deputy President last year one of two Scots holding the highest judicial offices in the UK. Lord Hodge. Thank you very much, Catherine, and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. It's a great pleasure for me to be present, or virtually present, at today's event organised by Justice Scotland. I have greatly enjoyed being involved and present in person, whether in the Signet Library or the Lake Hall, at events organized by Justice Scotland in prior years. And I'm very pleased that the constraints of the pandemic have not prevented this virtual gathering. So welcome to you all. The event is billed as a Human Rights Day lecture. It might better be described as a symposium because we have four very distinguished speakers who may need no introduction to people interested in the field of human rights. There are short biographies of the speakers on Justice's website, and the programme gives me time uh, to, get, to give only the briefest of sketches of them before we move to the substance of the event. Our first speaker this evening will be Professor Jim Murdoch of the School of Law of the University of Glasgow. He is well known as an author on and a teacher of human rights law. He has a 
significant international profile, as his biography on the website shows, and his Pro Merito Medal from the Council of Europe and his CBE for Services to Education and Human Rights speak for themselves. Our second speaker, Lord Hope of Craighead, has had a stellar career as Dean of Faculty of Advocates, Lord President of the Court of Session in Scotland, a Lord of Appeal in the House of Lords, and Deputy President of the UK Supreme Court. Since retiring in 2013, he has main, remained very active on the cross benches of the House of Lords, uh, 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 not least as their convener for a, uh, a considerable number of years, and is still keeping himself very active uh, in, in legal affairs internationally. Sheila McCall QC is the chair of Justice Scotland. She, like David and I, is a member of the Faculty of Advocates. She has a very busy practice specialising in criminal law and public law with a focus on human rights. She has worked for the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, and she is currently a part-time sheriff and a member of the Mental Health Tribunal. Our fourth speaker, Professor Nicole Busby, is Professor of Human Rights, Equality and Justice at the University of Glasgow. Her expertise in equality law, sex discrimination and access to justice has involved her in important editorial roles in research and in advisory work, including the, the Scotland Committee of the EHRC between 2017 and 2020. She serves as convener on the Board of Trustees for Close the Gap and is a trustee of the charity Making Rights Real. I thank the speakers for giving their time to speak today, and I now invite Professor Murdoch to open with his address on the original aim of the Human Rights Act. Jim. Thank you very much. Uh, my unmute button had simply frozen there. And thanks very much to Justice for organizing this event and, and particularly for this invitation to speak. Now, this seems to be a bit like a coming of age party, perhaps not so much a celebration as an assessment. And I see my role uh, really to, to set the scene for discussions uh, later. As the Human Rights Act enters adulthood, my question is, has it met its expectations? But also to consider how are its prospects, and in particular in light of recent developments on the political arena, will it indeed see old age? A good point, I think, is to go back in time, and indeed a good starting point would be the conference in Glasgow in October 2000, also with Lord Hope, a good uh, starting point as any. And those of us who were there back in October 2000, I think, had a sort of sense of excitement, almost of relief, that Scots law was finally catching up with other European domestic legal systems. For up until that point, all we really had in Scotland was Lord Hope's obiter and tea petitioner in 1997, encouraging the use of the convention in resolving certain statutory ambiguities. Before then, the convention was largely off limits, but this was an area which was more terra nullius than terra incognita, for Scots lawyers knew what we were missing. Thanks to fast expanding Strasbourg case law, there was a whole body of concepts, principles, and jurisprudence awaiting to be brought into Scots law. And certainly every schoolboy at least had heard of Campbell and Cousins and had appreciated what Strasbourg had done in that area. My first area for consideration relates to the wider constitutional context. And I think it's important to stress that the Human Rights Act was to be part of a package of constitutional reform. And Prime Minister Tony Blair in the preface to the 1997 White Paper, Rights Brought Home, made this very clear. He referred to a veritable programme, not only human rights, but devolution, including of course, to London and the English regions, freedom of information, reform of the House of Lords, reform of the voting system for the Commons, or at least the promise of a referendum. And other aspects, of course, were added in time, not least the Supreme Court and Northern Irish settlement. 
Now, constitutional commentators have questioned whether this was a programme or in reality, no more than a series of incremental steps, not all of which, of course, were fully implemented. My first point, I think, is from a Scottish perspective, three of these elements, at least of constitutional reform, most clearly involve a programme, these three elements being the Human Rights Act, the Scotland Act, and the Supreme Court. Now, why a programme in Scotland as opposed to ad hoc incrementalism, possibly elsewhere? Well, it was self-evidently necessary to dovetail convention rights found in the Human Rights Act into the Scotland Act, and of course, to establish a formal means of resolving disputes as to competencies. But it is fair to say, with the benefit of hindsight, that the original scheme for determining this interaction between the Scotland Act and Human Rights Act was not entirely satisfactory nor was the way in which convention rights was to be policed now by the Supreme Court in cases involving Scottish criminal proceedings. Now, much of this, of course, has been resolved by the Scotland Act 2012, and there is now a better constitutional fit between these three elements. And to this extent, this wider aim of the Human Rights Act, that it was to be part of a coordinated program of constitutional reform I think has been realized as far as Scotland is concerned. But of course, this constitutional package at a UK level seems again to be under threat for at least half of its life, various governmental or party political proposals have focused upon its possible repeal, normally involving a replacement with a British bill of rights and indeed very occasionally some of these criticisms have extended to suggestions the UK could even denounce the convention itself. Now in some contrast the current UK government seeks a much broader examination of the constitutional arrangements but withdrawal from the Strasbourg convention seems off the table and this broader um, picture, this re-examination almost of the starting point is of course happening through the Constitution, Democracy and Rights Commission, recently established, although it appears to be less of a commission and more of a number of what apparently are called work streams, two of which are already announced, the Independent Review of Administrative Law and the Independent Review of the Human Rights Act. And that second review has to look at the relationship between domestic courts and the Strasbourg court, and also the impact of the Human Rights Act. And this is the key bit, I think, on the relationship between the judiciary, the executive and the legislature. Now, while the current Lord Chancellor has suggested the government has not prejudged the outcomes of any of these reviews, there are suggestions from others, not least from the leader of the House of Commons, that the contrary may well be the case and may, may well wish to discuss this matter. For what I think all of this activity does not seem to recognize is that any unraveling of the arrangements as far as Scotland is concerned will certainly be constitutionally challenging. At the very least, it may well be difficult to see ways around the retention of the definition of convention rights in the Scotland Act. Now, my second focus is on the specific aims of the Human Rights Act itself, and the white paper spelt out two aims. First, that rights were to be brought home. There were to be domestic opportunities to enforce convention rights without the cost and delay of taking a case to Strasbourg. And secondly, and um, worth again remembering, the Act was intended to enhance awareness of human rights in society. If you like, it was to be a sort of blood transfusion for a sickly constitutional patient. A rights-based culture would reinvigorate our democracy as well as our legal system, and of course, have an impact on administrative law and legislative process. And all of this was to go hand in hand with a human rights-based foreign policy.
let me spend a moment or two on the second aim first. Now, within the legal system, the conclusion must at least be positive that we have this infiltration of human rights, norms and values. Whether we now have an ingrained human rights culture embedded into society as a whole, well, I want to come back to that. But the Human Rights Act and the Scotland Act hand in hand galvanized action and of course, legal actions, the Lithgow Sheriff Court itself appearing to be the very epicenter of human rights uh, litigation. But we see early on uh, real attempts by the Scottish Parliament to address any obvious defects in domestic law, the Convention Rights Compliance Act of 2001. We had an impressive amount of training awareness raising to have the legal profession ready. We also, of course, had these early successes, Stars and Ruxton involving temporary sheriffs and possibly Napier and Scottish ministers, a case well ahead of its time, at least from a Strasbourg perspective. All of this was entirely in line with Strasbourg expectations that domestic authorities were primarily responsible. All of this was also happening at a time when these newly emerging democracies were getting to grips with the implications of Council of Europe membership. And it was clear at that time that UK courts were exemplars of what judges could and should be doing. This is worth emphasizing. It can be overstated, but it certainly was a form of soft power. Also, of course, we have these new parliamentary arrangements, national human rights institutions, in particular, the Joint Committee on Human Rights and the Scottish Human Rights Commission. Um, still some work to do, as the Scottish Commission uh, in 2017 said, maybe in a Scottish basis, but certainly what was happening in Westminster with the Joint Committee was, uh, again, European best practice. Now, the proof of the pudding, of course, is in the eating. And at this point, I wish to try and share my screen and maybe indicate a couple of slides that uh, may well be worth examining. Now, I'm sorry that this is frozen in time in uh, April 2016. Um, these stats were given to me by someone in registry who's unfortunately moved on, but they are, I think, all revealing. And they show the first slide, the number of, of cases with some merit that proceeded to judicial uh, determination rather than straight into the waste paper basket. And you can see a dramatic fall, more dramatic is the number of cases involving the United Kingdom with one violation, at least. And we're now talking about penny numbers. And uh, a far more interesting is uh, what about the number of applications currently being made on a population basis per 100,000 of the population. And believe it or not, uh, citizens are least likely to take any action against the United Kingdom um, we are uh, really, in these terms, um, very, very successful. We have somehow made sure that rights have been brought home. Now, final couple of points about what possibly is happening or was happening in terms of judicial determination. The first approach, of course, was to follow and apply. And we had dictum early on, um, in particular from Lord Roger, Strasbourg has spoken, the case is closed. I think though, interestingly, we've seen a second and possibly more uh, interesting development. And this is on the basis of, I think of three understandings or approaches that we want to come back to in terms of the political concerns about the Human Rights Act, also shared by some members of the judiciary. And it's this idea, I think, above all, that Strasbourg has got a bit too big for its boots. Now, this seems to have had some form of impact. And the impact, I think, is that there is this return to first principles to be found in domestic law, unless somehow Strasbourg is seen to be um, requiring a bit more that um, only Strasbourg can produce. And here I think we see in the Osborne case in particular, a very strong suggestion that Human Rights Act should not be the primary protector, but very much 
um, the second reserves as and when required, possibly required in a couple of clear instances, above all, of course, when uh, statutory or common law protection is far more limited. Now, a couple of very final points, if I may. Where, uh, what, what does this actually reflect? And I wanted to take us back very quickly to what Lord Justice Law said in 2013. And it's the second paragraph. In the end, the law's authority rests upon public belief. Public belief. Um, and that must be, Lord Justice Law's reckoned, uh, somehow undermined by as he put it, the political controversies and resentments concerning Europe. Again, the Human Rights Court has got too big. Lord Sumption had made some similar points in Kuala Lumpur in 2013, um, critical of this overreach on the part of the Strasbourg Court. But let me finish with, um, if I may, um, simply a reflection on what it, this is likely to do in terms of um, the success rate. The more recent move away from reliance upon the Human Rights Act reflects this general failure, I think, to infuse the ideas of rights into wider society. But this in Strasbourg is indeed the age of subsidiarity. Um, this means that um, the court will um, defer to domestic decision makers, be these legislatures or courts, where it's clear that the relevant Strasbourg tests have been applied. The Strasbourg court may well have arrived at a different conclusion, but now accepts clearly that the domestic decision maker has, if that decision maker has asked the correct tests and answered them, this will be respected. The risk, and I put it no higher than this, is that too much of a deviation away from established tests in favour, again, of homegrown approaches could result in a higher level of applications to Strasbourg and, of course, a greater risk of adverse judgments. The paradox being that dangers of Strasbourg overreach in cases involving the UK would be reduced by a greater focus applying Strasbourg tests at a domestic level. The nub of the matter, of course, may well be that Lord Justice Laws was right. The failure to realize the Human Rights Act second aim of enhancing awareness of and indeed commitment to human rights may in time ultimately undermine its first aim to ensure domestic delivery of rights under the convention. And no doubt that's something we want to raise in discussion. Thanks very much for your attention and I look forward to the rest of the symposium. Thank you. I'm going to follow Jim um, now and first of all say what a pleasure it is to follow you and to be reminded of our meeting way back in the year 2000. Uh, I live in Scotland and I've worked here as an advocate and a judge for most of my career. But as uh, Patrick Hodge indicated at the beginning, I went to London to sit as a Lord of Appeal in the House of Lords in 1996. So I was there in the chamber when the human rights bill was being debated and I've been able to observe the progress of human rights law from the very start. But I have to say that as far as Scotland is concerned, my observations as to what has been happening here have been from a distance. The courts from which my view has been directed were and are in London. So I have had to depend on what I could read in reports and magazines and so on, and on the cases that came to us in London on appeal. I was not a party to the discussions that must have been going on here amongst academics and practitioners as to how our laws should develop. The judges have to act on what is given to them when parties bring the cases to the court. But I was able to play a part in its development from my position sitting in the uh, final court of appeal. I fear that the perspective I can offer you then is a rather narrow one, a bit of history if you like, but we did have our exciting moments, as you will hear. There's one other point I should mention, and that is that almost all the human rights cases that reached us were criminal cases about the Article 6 right to a fair trial. They were also the most interesting ones, so I will confine my remarks to them in this talk. But nowadays in the House of Lords, we're much more concerned with other rights, and uh, that's really outside my judicial career, so I won't mention that part in this discussion.
Now, there are five things that you need to know if you are uh, beyond Scotland. First, as we are considering what the Human Rights Act, Human Rights Act is meant for Scotland, we must take account too of the Scotland Act 1998. That was part of the package to which Jim referred. It received the Royal Assent 10 days later from the Human Rights Act on the 19th of November 1998. One of the tests of the legislative competence of the Scottish Parliament under Section 29.2 of that Act and of the devolved competence of the Scottish Ministers under Section 57.2 of that Act is whether what was done was compatible with the Convention rights as defined by Section 1 of the Human Rights Act. The language used in those subsections is very significant. These bodies, the Parliament and the Ministers, have, I quote, no power close inverted commas, to do anything that is incompatible. Second point, the Lord Advocate, under whose authority all prosecutions in Scotland are conducted, is one of the Scottish ministers. Section 57.4 then means that a prosecutor in Scotland has, again, I quote, no power to do anything that is beyond devolved competence. No power, in other words, to do any act in a way that is contrary to the rights under Article 6 of the Convention of the person against whom proceedings are brought. Third, questions as to whether or not something is in that respect within competence and therefore out with the powers of these bodies is referred by Schedule 6 of the Scotland Act to the determine of the judges, including judges sitting in London, first in the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council and now since its inception in 2009 in the UK Supreme Court. Taken together, these provisions give real teeth to the Convention rights in a way that I think Section 7 of the Human Rights Act does not do. Fourth, while it was decided that the Human Rights Act should not come into force until 20th October 2000, to give people to adjust themselves to its provisions, Sections 29 and 57 of the Scotland Act came into force well over a year earlier on the 1st of July 1999. So while from a UK perspective, the fact that the Human Rights Act now is 20 years old uh, is an important landmark. Uh, it has to be set aside the fact that we in Scotland can claim that it is now 21 years and six months since we have had to grapple with or take, a, take the benefit of what the Convention rights have to offer. And fifth, and really quite important, until it was brought into force, decisions of the High Court of Justiciary, the Supreme Criminal Court, Court in Scotland, were final and not subject to review by any court whatsoever. There was no appeal to London. But its decisions on issues about legislative and devolved competence could now be made the subject of an appeal to judges sitting in London, something to which Jim referred uh, uh, briefly in his talk. There was a different perspective in Edinburgh. It's perhaps not altogether surprising that judges sitting in Edinburgh took exception to the fact that some of their decisions in criminal cases were being reversed in this way. Although there were not all that many decisions of that kind, some of them were of great importance to the Scottish system of criminal justice. Before long, there was intense pressure for the system to be changed. Things had got so far that the judges in Edinburgh wanted to be given the last word as to whether their decisions should be open to appeal at all, a veto in other words. And the science was they wanted nothing to go south to London, whatever. In 2012, as Jim mentioned, a more satisfactory solution was found. The jurisdiction of the Supreme Court in criminal cases was limited to deciding what are now called compatibility issues. The important point being that it leaves to the High Court in Edinburgh to decide how to give effect to the decision in its determination of the appeal. That, coupled with the fact that the volume of such cases finding their way to London has diminished greatly since my time has meant that the cloud of resentment which did disfigure our relationship during the middle of the period under review has now happily disappeared. One of the commentators on the Human Rights Act observed at the outset that a Bill of Rights is a tool in the hands of judges, soft powers, as Jim said, and that the consequences of the Act were likely to be far reaching. How true that was was demonstrated in a dramatic way by one of the first devolution issue cases decided by the High Court of Judiciary in November 1999, the case of Stars against Ruxton. The court held that it was incompatible with Article 6 of the Convention 
for prosecutions on the authority of the Lord Advocate to be brought before temporary sheriffs as the nature and terms of their appointment meant that they could not be regarded as an independent and impartial tribunal. The decision that he had as section 57.2 says, no power to do this brought about a severe crisis in our system. Temporary sheriffs were widely used and the number of permanent sheriffs was far less than was needed. So here we were only a few months into the new jurisprudence with a severe and wholly unexpected joke to our system before the Human Rights Act itself was even in force. There was no appeal to London in stars but we in London did have a close look at that decision in a Privy Council case called Miller and Dixon in 2002, in which we allowed appeals in cases which had been tried before temporary sheriffs without objection. The question for us was whether the right to object had been waived. We held that it had not been, as the decisions not to object were not the product of a sufficiently well-informed choice. But it was interesting that in the course of our discussion, Lord Bingham told me that he wished that the decision in stars had been appealed. It was a hint that he would have found a way to find to, to, for a different solution. But he was willing in the end to accept that it was rightly decided when he wrote his judgment. Trouble at the first hurdle is my next topic. The first devolution case to reach the Judicial Committee was in July 2000 in a case called Montgomery against HM Advocate in 2001 session cases. The appellants who had previously been released from custody were brought to trial following a very vocal campaign that they were being allowed to get away with the murder of a member of a racial minority. The deceased, Surjit Singh Chokar, was a Sikh. Following their conviction, the issue that the appellants raised was about pre-trial publicity. We held that the appeal court had not erred in their assessment of the prospects of a fair hearing within the meaning of Article 6. But the case is noteworthy because of a sharp and very worrying disagreement in the Judicial Committee as to whether, whether the issue as to whether the Lord Advocates Act in continuing with the prosecution raised a devolution at all. Lord Hoffman said that Article 6 did not impose any obligation on the prosecuting authority as criminal charges are determined by courts not by prosecutors. So he said this matter should be dealt with under Section 7 of the Human Rights Act, not under the Scotland Act. I had to embark on a detailed analysis of the structure and content of the legislation with which the English judges who were in the majority were not much in sympathy. I had to do this to make it clear that this was a devolution issue within the meaning of the Scotland Act and that not to, uh, and, and not to be decided under Section 7 of the Human Rights Act for which there was no appeal in London. Lord Clyde, who was the other Scottish judge sitting with me, was in first, incli first inclined to agree with the others, but fortunately he did come round to my view, and the others in the end did not press their views to a dissent. But it was a close shave. The development of our law would have been very different if they had done so. As it was, however, this decision gave the green light to a detailed and well-directed campaign by Defence Council to search out areas of our criminal procedure and practice that were vulnerable to challenge on the ground that they were not compatible with what Article 6 requires. This brought about a profound change in our criminal evidence law and the way our criminal trials are conducted in Scotland as compared with how things were 40 years ago when I was prosecuting cases in my capacity as an advocate deputy. Looking back, it was all rather rough and ready compared with the care that has been taken today, now that we have to give effect to the conventional right to a fair trial. Of course, the concept, the concept of a right to a fair trial had been with us for many decades, but it has been much more, much enlarged and much more specifically directed than, as to its contents and effects than was, than was ever the case previously. The first important topic is disclosure. We refused permission in a number of the devolution cases that were appealed to the Privy Council as the campaign progressed and dismissed appeals and others. But in March 2005, two cases came before us in which we disagreed with the appeal court and allowed appeals which it had dismissed. These cases raised important questions about the Crown's practice in relation to the disclosure of information held by the police, which was very different from the practice as, as it was by then in England. These cases were called Holland and Sinclair in 2005. 
Now, in one, in one of the cases, the Crown had failed to disclose a statement made by a police officer to a witness at an identification parade, which might have cast doubt on her identification evidence and had withheld information about previous convictions of some of its witnesses. In the other, it had failed to disclose statements made to the police from which the witnesses departed when giving their evidence. What they did was according to the normal practice at the time, as I recall. Our decision to allow these appeals provided us with an opportunity to stress that the Crown under this new regime had to disclose to the defense all material evidence that was in its, in its possession for and against the accused for there to be a fair trial within the meaning of Article 6. This reinforced changes in practice were, which were actually already beginning when we heard the appeals. We returned to the issue in later cases and clarified later the test that should be applied by the court in the event of non-disclosure in a case called Allison and a later one called McInnes in 2010. Next, the right to silence. In 2011, there came before us a case called CADA against HM Advocate. This is case is so well known to those in Scotland that it, does, it requires very little introduction. In 1980, a statutory provision was introduced in Scotland, which allowed a person to be detained without charge for six hours while further investigations were being carried out. It was a well-intentioned measure, as I recall, because I was prosecuting at the time. But as time went on, the police began to realize that it allowed them to interview the suspect under caution without a solicitor being present as he had not yet been arrested. Cadder made admissions on the basis of which he was later charged and conviction. His appeal was based on a decision of the European Court of Human Rights about the importance of protecting a detainee against any kind of, any kind of pressure that might lead him to incriminate himself. That case was called Saldus against Turkey in 2009. The appeal was heard in Edinburgh by a court of seven judges for which, uh, to which great authority always has to be attached. They were unanimous in dismissing the appeal on the basis that Scots criminal law already had sufficient protections to ensure a fair trial for it to be unnecessary to follow the Strasbourg jurisprudence in Saldos. Lord Roger and I were of course well aware of the weight that we had to give to a seven judge decision and that to reverse it would cause much upset and alarm in Scotland. The police had been, in, had been regular and frequent use of the opportunity to question detainees without legal assistance now for many years, and the number of cases that would be affected were very many. But we both concluded after studying the reason in Saldus that we had no opportunity but to allow the appeal. The other judges who were sitting with us uh, came from England and Northern Ireland, and they'd been working with PACE over many years, case which had never applied in Scotland, and they would have had no hesitation in coming to the same view as well. So that was what decided. There is no dying, denying the fact that this decision, which was said to have shaken the Scottish criminal justice system to its roots, caused great offence to the judges in the appeal court, and was as powerful an example uh, as one could give of the importance uh, and the effect of giving the effect to a Spresvier decision in overruling a, a very high level decision of Scottish judges. The effect of the decision was to rebalance the conflicting aims of the process and crime control, of due process and crime control in favor of the convention right to a fair trial. It has been said that that case probably had the most impact of any other event in the past 20 years. It gave rise to a series of so-called sons of Cadda cases dealing with acquiescence and other things, to an important review by Lord, Car Lord Carloway and to the statutory forms that that review gave rise to and various other developments that are still working their way through the system. I think it's fair to say that but for the Human Rights Act, none of that would have happened. You must form your own judgment as to what to make of it for reasons of time I must leave it there. Within a reasonable time, there's one other issue that we had to deal with I should mention, and this is what should be done if there was a violation of the Article 6 right to a hearing within a reasonable time. Apart from the case of Montgomery, which I mentioned earlier, Lord Roger and I had found ourselves throughout our devolution issue journey, almost always in harmony with our English colleagues. But on this issue, we did not secure their agreement. In a case called R against IHM Advocate, there had been a delay of about five years, and the Crown accepted that this was an unreasonable delay. As we saw it, the question under the statutes 
was whether in these circumstances the Lord Advocate had power to proceed with the trial. We thought that as to do so would be incompatible with the convention right to a trial within a reasonable time, which we saw as a separate guarantee on Article 6 from the right to a fair trial, the answer to the question had to be no. Lord Clyde agreed, and we had a Scottish majority, but Lord Stain and Lord Walker said that in their view this was not the automatic consequence of the delay, and that as it was still possible, nevertheless, for it to be a fair trial, they would have allowed the trial to proceed. That decision was challenged and in effect disapproved of in a nine-judge English non-devolution case of Attorney General's reference number two of 2001 in 2004. It was held there that it would not be appropriate to stay criminal proceedings on the ground that there had been an unreasonable delay unless the delay made a fair hearing impossible. Lord Roger and I dissented, holding that while the Human Rights Act allows a choice of remedies, the no power wording in section 57.2 of the Scotland Act did not allow that. We felt that in their search for a decision that was in line with their more relaxed attitude to delay that was then was traditional in Scotland, the English judges had not given enough weight to that subsection and to the separate and distinct guarantee of a hearing within a reasonable time as compared with the guarantee to a fair trial. The issue surfaced again in a Scottish devolution case called Spears against Ruddy in 2009. In that case, it was admitted that there had been an unreasonable delay, but two decisions of the Strasbourg court had intervened now to indicate that provided the prosecutor speeds up and a fair trial is still possible, he is no longer violating. In effect, I'm giving effect to the, Scottish, to the English view as to how these matters should be dealt with. So we were able to agree at last that in these circumstances, the prosecutor is no longer violating and section 57.2 and no application. An embarrassing disagreement with English judges was avoided. My conclusion then, I retired from the Supreme Court in 2013. I confess that deprived as I am of easy access to information about what has been going on since I left, I cannot bring the particular picture up to date but I think I can say that all the main hurdles have been crossed by the time I left the court. It was already clear that fewer devolution cases were coming our way. Perhaps it is no coincidence that some of these who have been most active in raising these issues have moved on from the bar to other things. I should like to pay a warm tribute to all of these Scottish practitioners as without their skill and sometimes much needed determination, it would not have been possible for us to do what we did. For me, helped all the way until this untimely death by Lord Roger, it was a challenging and sometimes rather uncomfortable period. But it does seem to me that we have now been able to make full use of what the Scotland Act requires of us in giving effect to the convention right to a fair trial. And that our system of criminal law, although still evolving, is in a much healthier position as a result. Thank you, um, Lord Hope. It's a pleasure and a challenge uh, to follow on from um, two eminent legal scholars, Professor Murdoch and Lord Hope. So um, knowing where I can't compete, I'm going to step outside the strictly legal world and I'm going to spend a few minutes discussing the development of a human rights culture. Uh, and I suppose that title could easily have a question mark at the end because I don't think after 20 years of the Human Rights Act that we could say in Scotland that we have a mature human rights culture embedded in our society from top to bottom. But in the past 20 years, uh, I'm going to suggest there has been some remarkable progress. Just thinking about the foundations for a moment of the development of a human rights culture in Scotland. And I think arguably the starting point, as others have mentioned before me, uh, is not the Human Rights Act, but the Scotland Act. Uh, and when that came into force in 1999, it placed convention rights at the very heart of the devolution settlement in the two ways that Professor Murdoch and Lord Hope have already described. Um, Section 57, which Lord Hope focused on, um, the provision that the Scottish executive, as it was called then, could not legislate or act incompatibly with convention rights. And Section 29 uh, that Professor Murdoch mentioned, the legislative competence of the Scottish Parliament uh, an act of the Scottish Parliament is not law uh, insofar as it's incompatible with convention rights. So in contrast to the position in England under the Human Rights Act, uh, 
the courts in Scotland were given the power to strike down legislation on human rights grounds. Uh, and that power has now been there for in excess of 21 years. And, and can I say to you, the sky has not fallen in, uh, nor has the existence of that power of the judiciary over the stated will of parliament caused anywhere near the sort of outcry in terms of questions of democratic legitimacy, as it seems to have done in some quarters south of the border. So the Human Rights Act uh, and its more limited declarations of incompatibility um, do not greatly ruffle Scottish feathers. Now, why is that? Well, there may be all sorts of theories about that. And one of them might be that the doctrine of parliamentary sovereignty is not such a sacred cow uh, among Scots. There may be a lot of erudite legal argument to be had about that. But for the moment, let me just suggest that history and culture may play a part in that. There is a notion among Scots, whether real or romantic, uh, of popular sovereignty. So when the Human Rights Act came into force, um, one could argue that the ground had already started to be prepared to bring rights home. Next thing I want to talk about is a, a conference that took place in June 1999. Uh, and I was reading a, an old BBC report about it this week. It was organised by the Scottish Human Rights Trust. Um, and there was a focus on and a discussion about um, a famous Scottish case called the Ice Cream Wars. Um, two gentlemen, Campbell and Steele, had been convicted in what ultimately turned out to be uh, a, a case where the police had made up certain statements uh, by those gentlemen. Um, so there was discussion at this conference and a call was put out to the Deputy First Minister at that time, Jim Wallace, uh, QC, now Lord Wallace of Tankerness to set up an independent commission on human rights. Uh, at that time, the Scottish executive was a Labour Lib Dem coalition. And the creation of a human rights commission had been in the Lib Dem manifesto, but certainly not that of Labour. Lord Wallace, uh, in the early years of the Scottish Parliament, brought forward two consultations on the subject, with his stated aim being to help build a genuine human rights culture in Scotland. And initially that idea had cross-party support, the idea of a commission or a commissioner. But by the time the bill was introduced, it was a very different scenario. The very principles of it, never mind the detail, were opposed. But with some deft political timing and skill, Lord Wallace managed to get it through the Parliament. And the Scottish Commission for Human Rights Act 2006 was passed. It set up a general duty uh, for the Human Rights Commission to promote human rights and encourage best practice. And the scope of that mandate was not limited to convention rights, but explicitly extended to all international human rights treaties ratified by the UK. So in 2008, the Scottish Human Rights Commission, the SHRC, had its first meeting. No staff, no office, no predetermined plans, just a copy of the Act of Parliament, uh, a flip chart and four commissioners in a room. Uh, I had the privilege to be one of those founding commissioners. And we set out to decide how the commission should approach its mandate. And I think there were two important decisions taken at that early stage, which have contributed to the developing human rights culture. Uh, the first was the decision to adopt a human rights based approach in all of the commission's work. And the second was to focus on the wider international human rights framework rather than a narrow prioritization of convention rights. A lot of the initial work of the SHRC was around popularizing that human rights based approach using the panel principles, so participation, accountability, non discrimination, empowerment, and, and legality. Now, Nicole Busby may say a little bit more about a, a human rights based approach and how that's influenced parliament and government. But the idea of empowering rights holders to be involved in decisions that affect them and encouraging and enabling public bodies to meet their responsibilities has, in my view, played an important part in helping bring human rights into everyday parlance in Scotland, both on the streets, in the schools, in the workplaces and among lawmakers. You find people talking about human rights. The Commission began its work by mapping the landscape of all human rights in Scotland, uh, and that led in 2012 to the publication of a document called Getting It Right, and it used a traffic light system 
to identify where Scotland was progressing and where work was needed. And what was clear at that time in 2012 was that at a structural level, so law and institutions, references to human rights were frequent and explicit. And largely the levers or the mechanisms by which human rights could be realized were there. At a process level, so government and public bodies, strategies and policies, very few were rights-based in nature at that time and there was potential for some. So an amber light, I, I guess. But so far as outcomes were concerned, the everyday lived experience of rights holders, what we discovered was that this was where the greatest risk to the realization of rights in Scotland was present. Even where strategy and policy were rights-based, it was not reflected in delivery on the ground. It was a firm red light. So that research by the commission formed the basis for a participatory process to develop Scotland's first national action plan on human rights, SNAP. And civil society, public bodies, the government, the commission and rights holders all came together to devise and then implement that action plan, which had a program that ran from 2013 to 2017. So where are we now? Well, the independent evaluation of SNAP came to mixed conclusions. SNAP itself was lauded as an example of international best practice in how to develop a national action plan. There were examples of good practice uh, which had developed in the implementation phase. But one of the key findings, and all human rights lawyers and activists will have heard this before, one of the key findings that held back the realization of its ambition was that it was under-resourced by the state compared with national action plans globally, which is unfortunate because where structural funding was forthcoming, successful delivery of outcomes was achieved. Nonetheless, in 2018, the Scottish government relaunched its national performance framework and it included for the first time a human rights outcome. That was that we respect, protect and fulfill human rights and live free from discrimination. Now, whether that can ultimately lead to a deep human rights culture remains to be seen. Uh, I pause to note that the evaluation of SNAP identified a structural tension. Can larger duty bearers like the Scottish government be accountable on the one hand and solution generating on the other? Also in 2018, in light of the impending Brexit, uh, the First Minister Nicola Sturgeon set up an independent advisory group on human rights leadership, of which uh, Nicole Busby and I were privileged to be members. That group came forward with some recommendations, Nicole may say a bit about that, that have led to a national task force. So the question of whether we can build this deep lasting human rights culture remains to be answered. But Scotland is on a journey. Uh, and in closing, I suppose, in terms of a personal reflection over the last 20 years, it is that Scotland and Scots have become more confident in talking about human rights and using human rights to try and effect change to people's everyday situations. Uh, and it seems to me that the rest of the UK, and in particular Westminster, uh, is increasingly on a very different cultural and legal journey. Thank you. Good evening. Thanks, Sheila. Um, I want to thank Sheila for um, leading so well into what I'm about to say, and also to thank my fellow panellists for such excellent and thought-provoking contributions. I knew they'd all be hard acts to follow. I've been asked to talk about the future for human rights in Scotland. And in my contribution, I want to outline some recent developments which alongside the continuing application of the Human Rights Act have the potential to instill a progressive and comprehensive legislative and policy framework in Scotland. When talking about the manifold events and various processes that have marked the development of human rights in Scotland, we often talk, as Sheila just did, of Scotland's human rights journey. And while it's true that Scotland has traveled far in the 20 short years since the Human Rights Act was introduced and the 21 years since the, um, the Scotland Act came into force and still has far to go, it might be more accurate to think of this venture as an odyssey, reflecting the many twists and turns of fortune that Scotland has endured in fulfilling its aims of bringing rights home. Some of these turns have been imposed on us by circumstances beyond our control, 
Some have crept up on us when we were busy with other things. Uh, and some have happened um, when we have been busy not applying the constant vigilance which a true commitment to human rights requires. But some of these turns of fortunes have been of our own making when the required elements have slotted into place to bring about positive change for Scotland and its people through a culmination of individual and collective effort. The past three years or so of Scotland's human rights odyssey in particular have been marked by such activity, which it is hoped will set Scotland on the next stage of its voyage with optimism and hope for Scotland's human rights future. In Homer's epic poem, Odysseus encounters a total eclipse of the sun on his way home and an unlucky darkness evades the world. There are many things that this could symbolise, perhaps most obviously the terrible effects of the current pandemic, which have emphasised the need for enhanced human rights protections. However, there is also much to indicate that at this stage, Scotland's future prospects do look somewhat brighter. As Sheila has outlined, the work of the First Minister's advisory group marked an important juncture for Scotland's human rights future. The realisation that we could, I hesitate to use the words, take back control, perhaps a more accurate way of putting it is to take some control over Scotland's future in this respect, was an exciting and enthusing prospect. Our work in the group proceeded with caution, despite the First Minister's instruction to be bold and ambitious. In my own role as the person charged with keeping an eye on the limitations imposed uh, on our boldness and ambition by the Equality Acts reservation, I sometimes felt like the doomsayer as I brought my fellow group members down with my constant reminders of, we can't do that. But over time, the blue skies thinking and clever pragmatism of my colleagues took hold. And I realized that we could probably do quite a lot more than had originally been thought. So in the time that I have left, I'll attempt to sketch the reasons why, in my view, Scotland's human rights future does look bright. In doing so, I do not intend to paint an overly rosy picture. The inequalities that persist across Scotland and Scottish society make the need for enhanced human rights protections particularly urgent, and there are many challenges ahead, constitutional, political, cultural, which must not be underestimated. However, what I do want to do is to show how, as a small nation, Scotland has both the potential and the possibility to use a human rights based approach as a means of instilling real and sustainable improvements in people's lives. So what do we mean by a human rights based approach and what difference can this make? This approach requires enabling people to know and claim their rights, which, as we all know, doesn't happen by accident, but through a combination of the provision of accessible legal services related support and the availability of appropriate processes. It also requires those individuals and institutions who are responsible for respecting, protecting and fulfilling rights to be aware of their responsibilities and to be held fully accountable. The awareness and understanding of rights holders and duty bearers is built on participative processes by which individuals, communities and institutions take part in shaping the thought processes and decisions that impact on their human rights. A human rights based approach also requires us to ensure that policy making at all levels and decision making and the day to day life of organisations are imbued with human rights standards and principles. A human rights based approach doesn't occur naturally, but must be built through stealth and careful planning. Certain key elements are required that go beyond a human rights culture. Our lawmakers and policy makers, government and parliament, must embed a human rights based approach in all that they do. Public bodies must put human rights at the heart of their service delivery. The ability to hold duty bearers, including government to account, must be guaranteed. This requires regulators and, of course, independent courts and tribunals, which are adequately resourced. Human rights education must be available for all through both public, pu public education and specialist legal education and training for our future and current practitioners. Importantly, we must provide the means of ensuring access to justice for all. To fuel all of this requires a well-resourced, representative and engaged third sector,
and an open and transparent process for co-working with policymakers through meaningful consultation and participation. These elements, in my view, matter as much as having the correct laws in place. The Human Rights Act in its first 20 years has taught us that having the appropriate legislation for human rights practice is only one part of the picture, albeit a crucial one, for enabling and fostering a human rights-based approach. Alongside the crucial work of the courts in their developing human rights jurisprudence, which we've heard about this evening from Lord Hope, Scotland's law and policymakers have achieved some important goals in this respect. The requirement for ECHR compliance imposed by the Scotland Act has had a positive impact on human rights awareness within the Scottish Parliament, giving rise to a fledgling human rights culture. In 2016, the Equal Opportunities Committee became the Equalities and Human Rights Committee and was charged as part of its remit with a particular responsibility for human rights. The Parliament's Human Rights Roadmap reminds members of the need to be bolder and to strengthen our existing procedures and processes to make human rights more central to our work and how we undertake our scrutiny function and to be an exemplar of international best practice to other parliaments. This approach has informed legislation in Scotland, particularly that concerned with the delivery of public services. For example, the Social Security Scotland Act 2018 establishes a new devolved social security system in Scotland and attempts to ground it in a framework which acknowledges that access to social security is a human right. The interplay between Scottish civil society and law and policy makers has produced some impactful outcomes grounded in lived experience. The feminist organisations that comprise Scotland's women's sector have had a strong and positive influence over the recognition of women's human rights as evidenced in such cornerstone legislation as the Domestic Abuse Scotland Act 2018, which criminalises psychological domestic abuse and coercive and controlling behaviour. More recently, the Period Products Scotland Act 2020 places a legal duty on local authorities to make period products available free of charge to all of those who need them. Finally, a bill aimed at directly incorporating the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child into domestic law is currently making its way through the Scottish Parliament. Once enacted, the UNCRC Incorporation Scotland Act will make it unlawful for public authorities to act incompatibly with the Convention's requirements, giving children, young people and their representatives the power to go to court to enforce these rights. This brings me back to the recommendations of the First Minister's Advisory Group and the ongoing work of the National Task Force for Human Rights Leadership. The enhancement of human rights protections in Scotland has attracted specific political attention in recent years with a clear commitment to extend the existing human rights framework. In 2018, the First Minister's Advisory Group was established with a remit to make recommendations on how Scotland can continue to lead by example in human rights. The group made several recommendations, including that the Scottish Parliament should bring forward an act which will set out for the first time and in the one place the rights belonging to everyone in Scotland. In addition to restating those rights which people already enjoy, it was envisaged that the Act will provide further rights drawn from the UN Human Rights Treaties ratified by the UK but not yet incorporated, including economic, social and cultural as well as environmental rights. To enable full and equal enjoyment of these rights, the Act would also provide specific rights to children, women, persons with disability and on race drawn from UN human rights treaties ratified by the UK and provide corresponding rights protections for older people and LGBTI communities, which are not yet explicitly provided for by a UN treaty. The National Task Force for Human Rights Leadership is in the process of considering how to take forward these recommendations. Scotland's current incorporation agenda, once completed, will see social, economic, cultural and environmental rights enhanced and made more accessible and enforceable in domestic courts. These rights are no replacement for those civil and political rights provided by the ECHR, which are currently incorporated by the Human Rights Act. Together, both sets of rights will provide Scotland with a comprehensive human rights framework fully aligned with its international obligations.
But the enactment of legislation is only the start of the process. Enhanced human rights protection through domestic laws realization of international standards cannot happen in isolation. To be fully effective, this framework will require to be supported by guidance, education and training for rights holders and duty bearers. It must be explicitly linked to the widest range of interpretive tools for all of those charged with its implementation and ongoing interpretation. This will encourage and aid the development of jurisprudence joining all the rights available under international law and their underlying principles, ensuring coherence across the framework and securing its ability to keep pace with international developments. Without explicit provision in this respect, the take up in invocation of the rights themselves and their broad interpretation could be severely diminished. There is still a lot to do in building the infrastructure necessary for a human rights based approach in Scotland, not least in ensuring that as well as meeting our international obligations, we continue to meet those that arise through our position as one of the UK's four nations. My role of doomsayer is far from over. However, if its ambitious agenda comes to fruition, the next stage of Scotland's odyssey will see a strengthening of its dynamic and developing relationship with the international human rights framework and the international community that it serves. If all of the necessary elements are put in place, this will enable a human rights based approach capable of making a real difference to people's lives. That would be a very bright future indeed. Thank you. I've got the pleasure of thanking our brilliant contributors to our COVID style annual Human Rights Day lecture, um, which seems to be no less popular or no less interesting as a result of being neither on Human Rights Day or a lecture, as Lord Hodge observed. Um, our sincere thanks go to Lord Hodge himself, um, as I say, a long-standing supporter of the Scottish end of Justice's work and his elevation to ever greater heights does not seem to diminish his willingness to contribute to our work. Um, thanks, of course, to our contributors, um, Professor Jim Murdoch, Lord Hope, Sheila McCall QC and Nicola Busby. Um, what thought-provoking contributions. Um, uh, in my view, this is an analysis not heard elsewhere, certainly not altogether. Um, I think it has been a truly unique event. Thanks also to the staff. Um, they run our online events seamlessly. Much bigger and better resourced organisations fail to deliver such a well-presented event as they do. Um, and it's not just logistics. The staff from the director to the interns contribute to the thinking and ideas that go into putting an event like this together. Thanks to Pinsent Mainsons, um, who are our supporters for this event annually and who continue to support us and we hope well into the future. Um, and finally, thanks to, to you, our audience, for being prepared to remain at your screen at 5.30 in the afternoon um, and join us. Our thought leadership and outreach work are impossible without the engagement of interested people. It only means something if people are prepared to listen think about it, and hopefully talk to others about the ideas that you've heard. Equally, justice simply wouldn't exist without our supporters. We're a volunteer organisation in Scotland, um, and we rely on our membership to fund and carry out our work. For anyone who's not a member, attending an event like this is hopefully your first step in being drafted into the family. So join us. Um, benefits include attending member-only events, discounted rates on our superb an annual human rights conference um, updates on our work which covers many of the key issues of the day which you're presumably interested in if you attended tonight um, and being able to play an active role in our work if if that's the sort of thing you'd like to get involved in um, i would usually say networking is a benefit um, not so much right now um, but this is a finite a moment in time and um, we will all be enjoying a glass of wine after events like this again very soon. Um, in the absence of that, at the moment, a benefit is the members only part of our website with recorded events like this. Had you not been able to attend tonight for any reason, um, if you're a member, you can simply watch it back. Um, and there's lots of other great stuff that we've been doing in the last year um, there in the recorded section. Uh, it's not expensive. Non-lingual members, it's about four pounds a month. Students, it's just over a pound. Um, lawyers need to pay a little bit more, but that's okay. Um, and it's still about a fiver a month. So 
um, we need you. Please um, go to the website, go there right now, um, check out what we're doing and, and just sign up and join us. Um, I think hopefully someone's stuck something um, in the Q&A if you want to just click on it right now, so keen you are to join, um, but please do. Um, also, please follow us on social media. Um, we're on Twitter, LinkedIn and Facebook. Um, and you can hear more about our work through that as well. So thank you so much, everyone, for attending. Um, I don't think I've really seen an elegant way to sign off from these events yet on any that I've seen. So I'm just going to sign off with good night. <laughs>